Our culture and society tell us we are defined by the things we own, the money we collect, our pain and suffering, and our achievements in life. And yet God tells us that our value and worth can be defined by Him. We have been misinformed. Well, good morning, church family. In the ridiculous comedy from 1979 titled The Jerk, Steve Martin played Nathan Johnson, who leaves his home and community in search to search the world in order to become somebody. Now keep in mind it's 1979, and here is the day that the new phone book comes out. I wish I could get that excited about the... Nothing! Are you kidding? Page 73, Johnson, Maven, R. I'm somebody now! Millions of people look at this book every day! This is the kind of spontaneous publicity, your name in print, that makes people! I'm in print! Things are going to start happening to me now. The need within us to be somebody. I am what I achieve. My influence defines me. My life only has meaning if I am recognized as a success, a winner. This morning, we're gonna be exposing the God of achievement as a misinformed identity. I don't know if you heard the rumors this week of Tom Brady possibly returning back to the NFL. I heard that and I thought, how sad. Like Michael Jordan playing for the Charlotte Hornets, kind of sad. Here's a man who has accomplished everything you possibly could in football right? The goat, the greatest of all time. His personal life is in shambles. And I say it's sad because I don't think he knows who he is outside of football. You say, pastor, you can't know his heart. That's very true, okay? One can behave for a variety of motives. But as someone who's struggled my whole life with defining myself by my achievements, I can spot a fellow struggler. Turn with me in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. If you do not have a Bible, there's a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. You can take that and make it your own as a gift from us to you. You need a copy of God's Word, okay? Philippians chapter 3. Now, as you flip there, let me remind you of the foundation for our series. Two weeks ago, we looked at Genesis chapter 3. God created man and woman and placed them in the garden, and everything was perfect, especially their identity. They knew who they were. In perfect fellowship with God and with each other, made in God's image with purpose to fill the earth and subdue it. As we walk through Satan's lies and then the fall, you see, when man fell, every aspect of his, of his identity became fractured and disoriented. And the heart is filled with questions. And one of the main questions, the one we're going to put our finger on this morning, is Am I enough? Am I good enough? Am I smart enough? Am I man enough or or woman enough? Am I strong enough? Am I pretty enough? 
Now, it is to that longing that you will either listen to the lie of the enemy, and that is, you are what you achieve. Your, your life will have meaning if you are recognized as a successful businessman or the mom of the year. If you are recognized that you have achieved, then you will be happy. Then you will know that you are enough. Or your heart will rest in the fact that your identity is in Jesus Christ and that he Christ says that you are enough, not your achievements. And then we will see that he reorients everything about our longing for purpose and our longing to be great. All right, that's where we're going. So listen, as I read Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 2. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision, for we are the true circumcision who worship the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself, this is Paul speaking, might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else uh, has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I have far more circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, this morning I I pray especially that your Holy Spirit would allow us to discern the deep questions of the heart. Below the surface, Father, we spend so much of, of our time wrestling with just surface level, do this, don't do that. Father, through your Spirit this morning, will you expose, are we asking the question, Am I enough? And are we resting in your son? Or is there this endless longing and ache to achieve, to achieve, to prove that that we are enough, that we are better than our fellow man, that we are crying out for your attention, for any attention, this question, are we enough? Father, would you do your work this morning, as only you can do, and expose our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, now we just jumped into a context here in Philippians chapter three that it's, it's actually pretty unique and, and a little exciting, if you will. Paul is arguing against opponents, but in order to do so, he argues like his opponents and then will discard the argument. Now here, in Philippians 3, the opponents are Judaizers, okay? They they are Jewish national people who've come to Christ, but they are putting an air of superiority because of their Jewish heritage. And they are declaring to the Gentile church that they are the experts in what pleases God. Certainly not them, all right? So sit down and listen and just shut up to what we have to say. And in brilliant fashion, Paul rolls up his sleeves and says, listen, they think they have confidence in the flesh. They think they are better. They think they are somebody because they have the right stock like they have achieved. Well, if you want to argue that way, I have far more. So it's one of those times where Paul flexes from his past. Paul then lists four privileges of his inheritance, okay? Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, a tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, right? Paul's flex is that I'm of the right pedigree from 
the right family tribe. Now remember in our culture that we are extremely rare and unique where, where anybody can rise up and become a success, right? The pres- anybody can become the president of the United States. But that is not so in antiquity, right? Kings come from royal bloodlines. In the ancient world, having the right pedigree was essential. It was a sign that you were blessed of God because God had chosen you to be born into the right cast of society. Now, Paul follows his four inherited privileges next with three personal achievements. As to the law, a Pharisee, meaning I graduated from Pharisee University, okay? I'm highly educated. That was rare in those times. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, You see, everyone knew who he was. Even the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court, okay, whom he worked with personally. As to righteousness in the law, found blameless. Now that may not sound like a big flex to you or I 2,000 years later in a different time and context. So let me paraphrase for you. Paul is saying I was the man. I had rank and privilege and influence and recognition. By my culture standard, I was a successful somebody. And the heart inside the flesh of man says, look at all I've achieved. I must now finally be enough. Now, let me pull in one other passage, uh, because in 2 Corinthians uh, 11 and 12, Paul does something similar. There, Paul also has an opponent, but this time it's other Christians who are calling into question his status as an apostle. So again, he argues from the perspective of the world's boastful terms. Listen to 2 Corinthians 11. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? And he pauses here to tell you, I can't even believe I'm speaking this way. All right, that lets you know, like he's arguing their way and then he's gonna dump the argument. I speak as if insane to argue, are they servants of Christ? I more so. In far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without numbers, often in danger. And then he goes on to list his beatings. And once he was stoned and he was shipwrecked and spent a night in the sea. And he goes on and on and on. Now, I want you to notice the arrogant boasting of the world. Notice the flesh. This is you outside of Christ. Look at all I've achieved. <clears throat> Have you ever been around someone who's always fishing for compliments, who t- tries to find a way to brag about their achievements? They insert it into every conversation. Hey, I hear it's going to rain today. Well, you know, it was raining the day that I placed first in my over 50 left-handed racquetball tournament. (laughs) Do you boast about longing to be noticed as special? Also observe the flesh's endless comparison. So always comparison. So am I, so am I, so am I. I more so. You think you're impressive? Well, I'm more impressive. 
Anything that you can do, I can do better. You want to compare career? I've got more power and skill and influence. You want to compare stuff? I've got bigger, better, nicer stuff. You want to compare hobbies? Left-handed, over 50, racquetball champion. See, in life there are winners and losers. And I'm a win-at-all-cost sort of winner. Notice that achievement by the world standard is always comparison. It's always, I'm better than him or her. Listen to me. Discern the questions and longing of the heart. The question is, am I enough? Or to state, I am am enough because I'm better. And then look here in this passage how the exact same issues creep even into the Christian world too. Right? Paul says he's foolish, but he says, look, servants of Christ comparing how much they've sacrificed for the kingdom, all for the purpose of recognition to be somebody? And Christians, hear me, just because in one season of your life you have understood your identity properly doesn't mean that you don't forget and slide right back into the fleshly comparison of the heart in the next season. Jesus' own disciples, right, at least four times the Gospels point out that while they are walking along the way, they burst into an argument about who is the greatest in the kingdom. And the most dramatic of those scenes is in Matthew 20, when Jesus is walking to Jerusalem, and he's just told them that he's going to be crucified in Jerusalem. They're walking to Jerusalem, he's just told them. Now think about how somber this moment is supposed to be. And then James and John get their mom to go up to Jesus and to argue for seats of priority. And the rest of the disciples are furious because they did not ask first. Think about this scene. It blows your mind. They are walking with Jesus to his death and they are fighting for recognition. Now, so far, I've only pointed out the arrogant boasting of the heart when achievement is your identity. But listen to me, far more of us struggle with past failure and the hurts of not achieving. How do you handle failure? Blame? And anger, depression, being angry at God. Now, of course, you will have emotions of disappointment in the moment. God is not calling us to be stoic when a disappointment happens. Failure stings, and even for a while. But what I'm asking is, are you stuck in past hurt and failure? If coach had just put me in, we had a one state and I'd have gone pro. Recall my personal story from two weeks ago. When face to face with the uncertainty that I might not achieve my dream of becoming a top level division one soccer player, the fear of failure was too great. So I walked away. In the halftime of a game, I walked away. Because for me, it was better to avoid the shame of losing than to even try. Now, for others, you felt the the sting of failure, and you guard heavily against it by becoming a perfectionist. It's the same God of achievement. One avoids healthy risk, while the other becomes controlling, overly critical, quick-tempered, because the heart cannot handle the fear of failure. Am I speaking to anyone here? 
Am I by myself? Now, two things are consistent when achievement is our identity. One is you sacrifice godly priorities. Suddenly, it becomes way more important to achieve that promotion at work rather than to disciple your children. And suddenly, it becomes way more important for Johnny to spend six days a week practicing baseball rather be involved in the youth group. Ouch. You see what I did there? Our kids' achievements can become our identity too. The second thing that is consistent when your identity is in achievement is the people around you feel used, manipulated, as a means to your end of achievement. And then when they're no longer useful to you, you discard the relationship. Is this you? Do you discard people because all you really desire is your own achievement? Now, I think I've meddled long enough. You're like, good, move on. So what is the answer that Paul gives us? After arguing like the world, listing out all of his achievements of, I am somebody, what does he say? Philippians 3 But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish. Pause right there. Count them but rubbish. I love that. Paul is saying the God of achievement never satisfies. It's endless comparison, endless attempts to hide my deficiencies, to always try and measure up. And even when I do have all the accomplishments as Paul does here, it's trash. It still never satisfies. Paul says, I have found the better. Okay? In fact, he says, he says that Jesus is so much better that I will happily lose my identity in my achievements in order to gain Christ. And that I may be found in him. Christ is better. That he is the only one who quenches the question of the heart, am I enough? Because in Christ, yes, you are. You are chosen. You are God's very own. And you don't need to chase the God of achievement in order to fill that void. If I accomplish this, then will I be enough? If I'm recognized at that, then will I be special in God's eyes? Paul's answer here is filled with contentment and rest, isn't it? I count all of that rubbish that I may gain Christ and may be found in him. Last weekend, Scotty Scheffler, the world's number one golfer, won possibly the world's biggest golf tournament, the Masters in Augusta, Georgia. Now, this is, was his second win of the historic tournament, becoming one of only four to ever win a second green jacket by the age of 27. Now, if you know anything about golf, you know that Scotty is on pace to become an all-time great with the likes of Tiger Woods and Jack Nicholas. But if you know anything about Scotty, you know he's different from the world. Now don't get him wrong, he's competitive, he works hard, he loves to win. But as he said in interview after interview, golf doesn't define him, Jesus does. 
In fact, going into the final round of the Masters, with all the weight and pressure of winning, he said his buddies reminded him, Scotty, winning today doesn't define you. Jesus already accomplished all of that on the cross when he purchased you. Guys, that's what he said in the press conference after winning the Masters. And in fact, you may think he's crazy because I certainly do. He said that if his wife went into labor with their first child, he had a lead in the Masters. He said he would leave and withdraw from the tournament and go home and be with her. (laughs) Okay? Now, whatever you think about, talk about maintaining godly priorities. Beloved, I know we forget and we need reminding. You are in Christ. And I know your enemy lies to you and exposes past failures. You are in Christ. And I know you are tempted to boast in the pride of the world and in the flesh, but you are in Christ. Christ. Now I need us to pause right here and I need you to hear me say something really clearly. So please listen. Achievement is not bad. Achievement is good. It's very good. What I've been talking about all along is when a good thing becomes a God thing. When you worship the God of achievement, when success becomes your identity, and when we wrongfully try and answer the question, the longing of our heart, am I enough, by trying to achieve enough, only Christ can make you enough, and we must rest in that. But listen, God has made you for purpose, and in fact, to chase Greatness. Remember again in uh, Genesis chapter 3, in the beginning, before man fell and had a perfect identity, God still gave man purpose, right? They were in the garden, the garden was cultivated, but the rest of the world was not. And the charge was to fill the earth and subdue it. You know what that's a call for? Adventure, right? To go and to invent and to cultivate, and to make things beautiful, right? Make beautiful art, and to create. Be like God in as you fill the earth, and spread his image, right? That's what that calling was to do. So that desire to have purpose is good, to achieve, to be great. You know what? Change the world. Change the world. So do not hear this sermon as suppressing your desire to achieve. So beloved, change the world. For the glory of God, change it. You know what Jesus never does to his disciples as they're always arguing about who is the greatest in the kingdom? He never chastises them for the desire. He doesn't say, guys, that desire is wrong. You need to suppress that. Instead, he reorients it. He says, don't be like the world that tries to define greatness by being better than other people. Right? You be my servant and do all the stuff that I don't want to do. That's the way the world defines it. Instead, chase greatness as defined by the kingdom, by God's kingdom. The greatest in the kingdom are servants because they support and they make other people better. I'm going to get personal with you guys because I've struggled with this my whole life. I told you two weeks ago that my identity growing up was in being an athlete. I am what I achieve. And then the fear of failure caused me to just walk away. 
Well, I go to college and God grabs a hold of me. And he begins to teach me that my identity is in Christ alone. But maturity takes time. And for the longest time, all I knew how to do was to suppress desires. So I wouldn't let myself play soccer because I was overly competitive with a desire to win. All right, if you know me, uh, I am brutally competitive, all right? Uh, we've almost gotten divorce over uh, board games in my household, right? The, the tension when I am in the room is just like, like everyone can have a good time playing a board game and then I show up and everyone's like, oh, we're on a different level now, all right. So fast forward because the Lord calls me into ministry and I'm a pastor. Can I tell you a secret? Every pastor thinks they're the next Billy Graham. (laughs) And now that I'm in ministry, revival's coming. (laughs) And God calls me to a small town, Plainview, Texas, in West Texas that is Shrinking. Can I just tell you the questions of my heart that began to rise up that I had to deal with? Is my church big enough? Am I a success? You see, the same questions of the heart. And the longer I'm there, the louder that drum begins to beat. And then one day, the Spirit of God used Matthew 20, right, where the disciples are arguing with Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom? And then the Spirit of God just said to my heart, desiring greatness is good, Jason, it's good. But just don't define greatness the way the world does. Define greatness according to the way I do, according to the kingdom. That key set my heart free. Or you got to understand how this works, okay? Jesus is my identity. He's the one that made me somebody. <clears throat> and this desire to achieve and to do good, right, and to be great, all of that is good. He calls us to do his kingdom work as an act of worship. God made you in his image. He put the Holy Spirit inside of you. He gave you natural talents. He gave you his spiritual gifts, right? And I love to use them for his kingdom. God, I love to serve and to glorify you. Guys, this is the key. No longer trying to achieve glory so that I have my own self-worth, right? Usually by pushing others down. Now I'm somebody. No, no, no. Jesus already says I'm somebody. And the good that I now achieve is an act of worship. That's the key. Therefore, when I fail, according to the world's standards... It's not a fail according to the kingdom because it was done in worship and obedience to him. So as I wrestled with feeling stuck in plain view, as if God was wasting all of my talent, I remember the greatest in the kingdom are servants. And you just say, God, I'm here for you. Obedience You can use me as you wish. And then when you succeed according to the world's standards, right, we don't boast in the pride of ourselves because it's done in worship and obedience to him. So by every metric according to numbers, financially, uh, baptisms, right, over the past three years, God has blessed First Baptist Birdie with success. But God forbid that I would boast and make that my identity. 
Now first, let me say that like, God has done amazing things. God has orchestrated and fit me with my personality with a church that was an absolute just God thing. And I praise him for it. He orchestrated so many things. And the portions that I have played Guys, it feels amazing to be used by God. I feel like I am doing my life's work. But I remind my heart that it, the only place for this is in worship, in worship to him, that he would get glory. Now, I share all of that with you because now I want you to discern your own heart. Is your heart believing the lie, I am what I achieve? Do you desire greatness to glorify yourself so that you can be somebody? Or has your heart been set free, realizing that Jesus has already made you somebody? He is your identity, and you are his and that all of the success and even failure, you are now free to offer to him all of your achievement as worship. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we praise you that you have given your son not only to save us, but to be our identity, to satisfy the longing and the deep questions of our heart, and then to allow us to walk out in freedom, freedom to be who you've created us to be, and to glorify you, not to steal your glory, but to glorify you as an act of worship. God, and when my heart is right, it sings and it overflows with thanksgiving. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I pray all across this room that your spirit would be opening eyes and allowing each individual to discern with clarity the questions of the heart and how Jesus is the answer and show them, Father, the freedom that's on the other side. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Church family, the praise team's gonna lead us in a final song and this is your chance and opportunity to stand and to sing in faith and to respond. However the Spirit of God has spoken to you, you must respond. We'll have ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you. If you need someone to pray with, if you have a burden, you do not carry that alone. We are a family. We are together in this journey. If you want to use these steps or stage as an altar to pour out your heart before the Lord, Whatever decision the Spirit of God has pressed upon you, please be obedient to respond to him. Would you stand?